I'm sure not. Okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we will now transition to to what I consider the the salient thing to focus, which is not which is the modeling tradition to rule them all, but how do we use these modeling traditions, each powerful in their own right, each universal in their own right, each at some level capable of, of characterizing the world in their own right? How do we use them artfully? How do we combine them skillfully? How do we combine them to make best use of, of our human time? How do we combine them in ways that is most efficacious, most efficient? and productive to accomplish our goal. And the good news here is there's amazing. And up these opportunities are increasingly tapped, but are, um, but are I think, under recognized uh, in the community. So system science methodologies are highly complementary. They're highly complementary using a portfolio of models of different types in the same project. Um, they're also complementary when used in the same model. And there's real synergy for this. And, and as I said earlier when, and when talking with Michael, you know, uh, the different methodologies are often used to pursue different questions. And they invariably get you to approach the problem in somewhat different thinking and mindset. And what you really want to do in many cases, is to get different perspectives on the problem by using different models. And by so doing, you come away a lot more savvy. You see it from multiple sides. Or to quote Saskatoon native Joni Mitchell, you see it from both sides now. You see it from several, several sides. Yeah, Joni is from here. Um, so, uh, so, you know, a few motivations for this. Um, you could secure comparative advantage. Um, uh, you can you can represent things that are suitable for frame network for framework A. Let's say system dynamics and system dynamics, and things that are best suited for discrete event modeling, discrete event modeling, things that are best suited for agent based modeling and agent based modeling. And you can mix and match in the same model. So you could have some areas of your population. Maybe it's your general population. Most people in the population are low risk, maybe, so you're concerned. And you represent them with a stock and slump. No fuss, no muss, you don't go into that. But individuals of more risk, you, you, make, you uh, capture them with a agent-based model. Capture their, them in more detail. When one of those people goes to engage in care seeking and you're concerned about availability of resources and whether they'll get timely care, say for, mental health complaints or for addiction complaints where the waiting times can be very long and you want to know what types of resources do we need to put in to make it timely to use discrete event simulation for that portion of the model and you change that boundary over time as you learn. Um, so as you learn, you may change what's in compartmental model, what's in other words, the system dynamics aggregate model and at what point you create people as agents. Maybe, maybe early on, it's, it's those at very highest risk. And then you work upwards, you realize those at moderate risk, we really will benefit by representing them because there may be certain preventive in interventions, which um, you know, we, we really need to understand their history or their social context or, or geographic context. So we represent them as well. You change your boundary. Um, you, you can speak for some areas in model, maybe it's the clinical representation of the model to stakeholders in terms that they understand. And you can get greater computational efficiency. Compartmental models, um, system dynamics models and aggregate level are wicked fast compared to an agent-based model. There's a lot more going on, a lot more moving parts in agent-based models. You double the population size in a system dynamics model, it doesn't change the running time at all. A stock and flow model, that's aggregate, right? It's computing with bigger numbers. Just like Excel doesn't run slower when you add two big numbers than it does when you add two small numbers. Same thing, right? Um, you double the population size for an agent-based model, it makes a big difference, right? Now it 
runs at least twice as slow and sometimes more than twice as slow. You have network effects or, or you start getting to memory limitations, et cetera. Um, uh, so you can get great computational efficiency gains by representing, say, the bulk of the population using an aggregate approach that doesn't require a lot of moving parts, and then using more artful ones uh, where you need it, which are, which are more detailed. And you get multi-scale model, modeling at different scales. So I'm going to present to you, ladies and gentlemen, five compelling modeling um, patterns that we have used extensively in our work. And by the way, when I came out with this, I got a lot of flack from certain, certain practitioners of particular method who complained that I was just having academic fun and I was just conjuring up sort of weird strategies to use these methods when really there's just one true modeling method and it is X. And I, different ones in my social network will tell me different X. Um, but but I, I got a lot of flack for these because I was, it, it was almost like misogynation or something. You know, I was like having mixing between these methods that are that God intended to be separate or something like that. And and I have zero time for that and zero tolerance. Um, so I've just ignored them. And and these methods have stood the test of time, and other practitioners have adopted them. And I think you'll see why because they have just so much direct movement. And unless you're a partisan for one of these methods, it's just so compelling once you look at these methods. So let's take a look at this, can we? Is that okay? Okay. Um, so I provided you a whole bunch of models that show this. So, so the first one is service population interaction. Here we have individuals in the population who are circulating, but they need to go in sometimes for, for, for needs, for health services or social services, or maybe they're involved in um, the criminal justice concerns and court proceedings, structured process. Maybe they're enrolling in the VA, um, you're getting their paperwork through for you know, PTSD treatment, whatever it is. Let, let's, go, let's go open a model which shows this pattern. So I provided you uh, in the example models area, um, uh, a um, uh, a model which which I, I actually have many models there will show this pattern, um, but let's go find them. So if we go to participant resources, that's the link up here, right? This ABM Bootcamp 2022, um, and we'll go to example models, and uh, this model, as I recall, is under hybrid models. By the way, there's a bunch in there, but um, one step at a time. Um, okay, and we'll scroll down and it's called multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects and locking. Okay, um, sorry. Um, so I'm gonna download it. Remember how to download, right click on this. Um, uh, or if for some reason you have trouble, you can go, you know, um, go click on it, you know, close your eyes, close one of your eyes and click download here, okay? Um, so I download it. Let's go open it. Does anyone need more time? Who needs TA help? The TAs are thin but stalwart. Uh, sorry, sorry, that's not weird. There, there's not many of them. I mean, there, there are thin evidence in the room. I don't know where my other TAs are, but I, I'm not referring to the physiques or anything like that. Um, so um, they will, they will be ready to serve you. Um, um, and, and, and help you out, okay? Um, so I'm loading this model in. Does anyone need help? So which model was it? If you want to, it's, it's multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects and loss. Okay? Um, you might think, you might be forgiven for thinking, I'll just look for the one with the longest name, but you'd be really, really surprised. Okay, so I just opened this. So let's go browse this model. So let's go to person. Let's go with CR, CR theory of person, if we could, right? So here we have infection state chart on the right. This is probably familiar stuff, right? Right? Um, and on the left, we have a care seeking state chart, whether they're not seeking care right now in transit to care or under care. So there's going to be some mobility going on. 
some movement around. They're going to move around space. It's going to be quite relevant for this afternoon. Um, and notice they have a sex income and home. So each person, let's go click on home. And you'll notice each person has a, a home. It's a home, right? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a home. And if you look, that's an agent type. There we are. It's a home. Look at that. It looks homely. Um, it likes the chimney, but you can tell it's not a chimney. Um, okay, so um, uh, you'll notice there's other agent types too. There's a clinic, and clinic has a more articulated characterization. Anyone recognize, of those three modeling types, anyone recognize what type of modeling this is with? Discrete event. Yeah, people flow through. There's a set of healthcare workers, a certain count of them, um, and um, given by the count of healthcare workers in Maine, the parameter. And they flow through. Some of them leave without being seen. Other go flow through, and there's a certain probability of treatment failure or treatment success. Okay, so sometimes they're treated and they're cured of their ailment. Let's say an STI, sexually transmitted infection, like gonorrhea chlamydia. Um, sometimes the treatment is successful, and sometimes the treatment is unsuccessful. Um, uh, and if the treatment is successful, we will let them know. How would we let them know the treatment has been successful? They are now cured. Well, yeah, they do leave. In fact, they leave, even if they haven't been cured, they don't realize it yet, so they leave too. Um, so how would we tell, in any logic, how would we tell someone, you are cured? What does this sound like? I, I send them a message. Yes. Um, so it turns out with successful treatment, Take a look at this. It's right in here. Um, I send them a message. If they go and they're cured, I send them a message saying, you are cured. Okay? And, and they're therefore cured. Right? Um, of their ailments. Mm. Um, Jeff McDonald, I can't remember if it was this model or another model, who said, they, it's as if they have walked through a healing beam. <laughs> you know, heals them. Okay, um, so um, so so now let's go to Maine. We're going to go down Maine, and you'll see there's actually a population of, of people, of homes, and of clinics. And up above, there's some graphs showing like the number of people ill and and um, the, the prevalent case count. Um, this also is um, oh um, oh I see. This is actually healthcare worker utilization shouldn't be called prevalent cases. It should be like healthcare utilization. Um, and then uh, up here will be another one, which is count of times they've been ill. Think about an STI. They keep on, if, if they get chlamydia, they'll come in. If they're treated successfully with antibiotics, they'll go you know, with that bout of chlamydia resolved. But if they just go back to their sexual networks, if they're not practicing safer sex or something, chances are they'll get it again. They'll just go right back and be exposed to you know, one of their partners with chlamydia, right? Um, so um, uh, let's, let's go, so we keep track of the number of times they've been infected. Let's go run this. Can we run it? Can, cannot. Can, okay. So I'm gonna right click and say single clinic hazard here and we'll run it. And here we go, run, okay. And what you'll see is people in homes, um, and uh, the ones that are in yellow are are uh, exposed, but not yet infected, I believe. Um, maybe they are infected. I'd have to check the, the sort of coloration. I am speeding this up. Oh, they've become infected here. Um, um, and notice that they are they are going and interacting with others. Um, and uh, they are interacting with nearby, so I didn't show it, but while it's running, I'll tell you, uh, if we go to Maine and we go to space and networks, they're in a distance-based connection with connection range 75. We could have shown this. Um, maybe I'll, I'll show it just to make it more visible. We'll show that network. Do you remember where I go to show that in a network? Where would I go? Anyone remember? Uh, yeah, but to show, it turns out that, that to make it visible, you just go to this connections and you say, 
draw a line connecting. Given that they're already connected, you just want to draw the line. So here we're going to do it again. And, and this will make the make evident the network. Here we go. Boom. Um, and oh, 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 okay. So what did I what did I rumble? Um what did I do wrong here? Um I thought I had okay, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna burn much time on this. They should have um should have been connected up. If one of the TAs could look into what's going on here, that's uh, that's interesting. I would have expected that to show the network, but maybe there's something else going on. If anyone else could look into it, I'm grateful. Um, okay, so um, so here they are, and we'll speed it up and uh, let things proceed. They're infecting others in their network uh, over time. Oh, there it is. There's the network. No wonder I hit it. Um, because it's kind of overwhelming visually. It's just so many connections within 75 range. Um, but I'm going to, to speed it speed it up here. Okay. Um, and you will see people uh, get, oh, you know what? I'm going to, I'm sorry. I'm going to turn it off again. It's it's just so overwhelming, it will obscure what I'm hoping to communicate. So so I'm gonna stop that. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to write it, click, you see there is a network, I'm not going to show it, and we will again run this. Okay. Um, so people go for when they're ill, um, uh, they will start a transit to care with a certain probability if they are ill. Remember someone asked me what the guard is? They will only make this transition going to care if they're in an infective and symptomatic state. It's only then that they will trans consider transitioning to care. And then they will go to the nearest clinic. We get the nearest clinic and we move them to the nearest clinic. So we're going to move them to the nearest clinic. And guess what's happening? Can you see what's happening in the population? Uh-oh, what happened? A lot of chlamydia. A lot of chlamydia. That isn't what is meant by Saskatoon Trump. But one fellow faculty member in computer science once quipped, maybe that's, it would be more appropriate to say Saskatoon claps because we have very high rates of gonorrhea in, 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 this, uh, in this province. Um, so uh, in any case, we have very high rates uh, of, of infection going on. People are seeking care at the clinic but let's go check what's going on at the clinic. Uh, if we go and look at the clinic, here's our clinic. Um, you'll notice that it's treating a lot of people, um, but there's actually millions that are leaving without being seen. Why would they be leaving? Not enough resources. The healthcare workers there are totally maxed out at 90%. Even though people are leaving, they're maxed out and they're leaving because they're waiting a long time. You see that? So people are, are getting treated. About 91,000, 92,000 people have been treated thus far. Um, most of them successfully. About 5,000 have been received treatment failures. The, the antibiotic didn't clear the chlamydia infection. But, but the healthcare workers are maxed out. We can add a healthcare worker. We can make it two. We can make it three. We can make it four. And that will lead to our ability to, to treat more. But is it enough? Let's go back to the main model. I'm going to click on this house here. Um, so that's brought it down from like 1,100 to like 700 something. But it's still circulating at a lot, at a very high level. Saskatoon's still trying. Um, so we're going to, we're going to have to do something more than just add a few more healthcare workers to that clinic, right? Okay, so, so let's suppose we add a clinic, a new clinic, ready? I'm gonna add a new clinic. Um, actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start this again so we have all clinics with one healthcare worker each, just so we're, that's why I stopped it and I restarted it. And here we have this transition. Notice it went through a phase change. That was an emergent property. The first, the first little bit, it was just sort of petering around, see it? And then it just went like that. 
and during the health during the COVID, the earlier stages of the COVID crisis, you probably remember situations like that where you're waiting for it, waiting for it, and then boom, it started to to spread. And it's like this. So it's up at around 1,100. So let's add another clinic. Can we add a clinic with this button? Watch this. Boom. We're 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 adding a clinic. Here it is down here. People have started to go to it because now it's their nearest clinic, right? Remember, they go to their nearest clinic for them. Okay, now we brought it down to like 900, mm -hmm. um, 980. Well, we've helped. Let's, let's add another clinic. By the way, you see it says count clinics too. I'm gonna add another one, boom. Okay, um, and it's called clinic three. Now brought it down to like 850. Okay, I, I need more than that though. Um, if, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna stamp out this outbreak of, Chlamydia, which is of a distressing proportion. I'm going to add in a fourth one, right? Um, and if you if you look around, you'll see that it's adding in these little sort of shapes here. Okay. Um, but uh, let's let's go see. It's brought it down to to 700. Uh, oh, oh. Um, uh -oh. oh, you know what? I, Okay, okay, um, mumble, um, okay. Um, so this is, it's rebooting, but it's, it's been brought down to about 500, 475 or something like that. I'm gonna add another clinic yet. You can see all this, oh, look at that. What happened? Went to zero, six clinics was the trend, right? Ladies and gentlemen, six clinics. See what we're doing here. We're mixing together a public health analysis of the spread of infection. How do we navigate to the clinic in the simulation window? Yeah, good question. So you click this button over here, Maurice, this, this little thing will call up this panel. And then you click up here and you drag down to clinic. Okay. Um, and and you can choose the clinic. Hopefully, hopefully that's what helps. So if I, again, if I go up there again, I can pull this down and choose clinics. And then I can browse each clinic in turn. Uh, I'm sorry, I can browse each clinic in turn. First clinic, second, third, et cetera. You see this picture? Yeah. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, you see what's going on here? We have a public health crisis, a public health situation, the spread of infection, um, just like we, we simulated spread of, of kind of smoking yesterday, spread of infection, exposed people. You know, they get infected, they're exposed, and then they go into an infective state. Periodically, they expose to others by sending a, a message to others. This should look familiar. Um, and, and that's leading to spread of infection. But this is a treatment-mediated infection. And so in order for them to be cleared of the infection, they need to secure treatment. And where do they secure treatment? At a clinic. And how do they get treatment at a clinic? They, they then um, have to present and they have to wait. And how long do they have to wait? It depends on how many other people are waiting and the number of healthcare workers, right? So you see it's an interplay, right? And it shouldn't be lost on you that what's going on at public health level affects the clinic, the, the flow of people in the clinic, the, utilization of the healthcare workers, right? Those are all affected by the demand from the public health situation. But also uh, there's a reciprocal influence on uh, of the clinic on the public health situation. If clinic resources are underwhelming or overwhelmed by the level of care presentation, they're not gonna be able to offer timely care and people will leave they, or they otherwise won't get treated quickly. Uh, even if they were wait, they wait a long time, and and fuck, they could spread while waiting. It um, probably not in line at the clinic, but um, uh, but this this is a reciprocal relationship. And what we just did was to look at the effects of resourcing on the care side, adding more clinics, adding more more staff in clinics, and saw its public health consequences. You see, so there's that reciprocal causality that's captured because we have both types of models. We use discrete event simulation for where it shines, which is in representation of the, of the resource limited workflow for treating people. And we used 
agent-based modeling for where it shines, agent-agent interaction in a situated environment, in you know, presentation of individuals to care, et cetera. So there's this intricate reciprocal causality, and it is captured in a very neat way in a model like this. Um, you notice when they go to the clinic, um, they head there. Here, they they get to they find out the nearest clinic and they move to it. And they're in transit for some time. And when they arrive, that's is an arrival transit. They arrive there. It, it basically, they say, hey, hey, clinic that I'm going to, pick me in. Um, beam me up, Scotty. You know, it's just like, take me into the clinic. Um, you know, maybe not as good as take me into, take you down to the ball game. But it, they take into the clinic there. And um, by going into the clinic, they are then brought into this process in that clinic, and they will then wait. So we've looked at this reciprocal causality with this model. On the one hand, public health factors, spread of infection, et cetera. On the other, care delivery, so service delivery, each using a language well-suited to it, each using a modeling approach well-suited to it. We could elaborate this with a discrete event simulation as we see fit. We could add you know, rooms and healthcare workers, we could add doses of antibiotic available if that were a constraint, et cetera. We could examine the locations of clinics, the number of people at the clinics, the types of resources, the, the care teams. We could have, you could have, you know, a um, counseling service here for frequent flyers, for friendly faces, that if they've been seen by the clinic more than three times, we give them behavioral counseling. And that may mean they're less likely to engage in high risk behavior and, and get infection. All that is readily possible. And it's possible because we can weave these two types of models together. Mm -hmm. And we can nimbly examine effects on the one side or the other side with this model. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is compelling pattern one. Um, and that's been a compelling pattern, which we have used extensively within our work, including in COVID-19, but in many, many other spheres. Um, okay, um, so let's go to the second. An individuated, yes, Larissa. Oh. Cured to the, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the party that's sending the message, this occurs here, it, it is the clinic. The clinic is sending the message. Um, and actually, technically, it's this this little block that's sending it within the clinic. But this it is the clinic that at this point in the workflow, if it is a successful treatment, so it flips a coin. That's what this is capturing. It flips a coin that is that will the probability of treatment success. It will turn up heads. If it turns up heads, that's this on exit true. It will send a cure message. If it doesn't, if it if it's not successful, um, then it will it it won't send a cured message, and the person will remain in dis, in distress. They'll they'll re, or they'll remain you know in, in, with their ailment, right? And receiving that cured message, guess what it does here? Can anyone venture a guess? How would receipt of the cured message impact this agent? Yeah, and so which transition is it? this one. It's when they receive the cured message that they go back from this state to that state. Otherwise, they don't. Okay? Easy peasy, simple, and, and helpful. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so let's go on to the second part. Um, this, is, this consists of another very common pattern that we've applied um, to really good effects, including for capacity planning during the pandemic. Um, Actually, in, a, in, a, in, in several models, we've, uh, we, we've applied um, these patterns during the pandemic, but um, the particular model I have in mind by Yuan Tian, one of my leading doctoral students um, who's over in Korea teaching right now, um, she, uh, she has a model which, has, uh, which was used during the pandemic early on for capacity planning projections in which involve a upstream population of the healthy population. Once people are infected, they become agents. 
So here we have a population which once it reaches a certain level of risk, they turn into agents. Before that, they're just numbers. They're just counts um, of people in a certain stock or, or stratified sort of element of a stock. And then they turn into a full-blown person um, that has a face upon the world and are followed at an individual level thereafter. Um, let's, go, let's go look at that. Let's go look at a, a, that sort of pattern. And you know, I should probably um, show a diagram. It looks something like this. So they start in a system dynamics model. They're just counts, right? They're just numbers. Um, they're just a person who is in this population. Realistically, this might be stratified by age and sex or something. So we know they're a 55-year-old female or something like that, or 55 to 59-year-old female. But they're they're just a number. They're just a count. They're, we don't have a we don't have a history. We don't have lots of, of detail. We don't have a net. Super net. But once they develop diabetes, or once they develop pre-diabetes, or once they develop you know get infected with COVID nineteen, or once they're a close case of someone with COVID nineteen, or you know have 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 um, others in their age group sufficient numbers. Um, we will then, um, I'm not sure what's going on here, but um, uh, hopefully people can see, see this. Um, could someone try to grab someone in the tech staff room? Um, uh, frequency out of range, Teresa. Thank, thank you. Um, okay, so this is the basic idea. Um, and this was used here at COVID-19 by UN with uh, great effects. Uh, and by the way, she was capturing like some chronic disease risk factors, age, sex, I think. And we had it flowing down to an agent population, which by the way, could then flow into service delivery pathways to the street event plan. Uh, it, was, it was quite nice. That wasn't our main, the, the, the model that achieved biggest prominence. There were two others, um, a particle filtering model and, and model built originally by Wade and, and hopefully which we'll, we'll see from Kurt. Um, uh, in this boot camp, but let's go. Let's go open a model with this. So we're going to open a model. Let's go. Let's go repair to that to that um, place here, and we're going to go to hybrid models again. It's in hybrid models, and we're going to go to the budding hybrid SD and ABM model. The name of this refers to Sandro Galea's quip about agents being budded in a in a model. Um, so. Um, Indeed, indeed. Um, by the way, they were in here in some force this morning. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, it's working great, um, except that the center screen is there. But yeah. Well, no, it, it kind of went on the fritz a few minutes ago. And I thought maybe it had turned off and there was some evidence that it had. So I, I upped the time because I thought maybe they didn't set it too long enough when they came in this morning. But then it, it just, out again. So, sorry, folks. Uh, online, it's it's some um, um, you know, computational dysfunction. Um, so uh, let's go load this model in. I just downloaded it. It's the budding hybrid model under hybrid models. You have that? Okay. Okay. Um, so we're going to say close all. Uh, no. And uh, I don't. I'm not going to save them. And uh, I'm going to say open, boom, and I'll do budding hybrid. Here we go. Um, uh, so, yeah, we don't want to lose people on these things. In other words, yeah, don't do anything which right. limited. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. That's the hard part, I think. Constraints. Um, so, so we're going to run this model. So, so oh, well, I should explain. So this is this is about as simple a rendition as it gets to just communicate the idea. Um, so there's non-diabetic agents, uh, so normal glycemic agents you could think of it. Maybe it includes pre-diabetics, and and you have some flow which goes over. This, the details of this are not important. There's some system dynamics model that's upstream, basically, and and then they flow down, and once they reach this point they get created as an agent. So this agent, this, this event, oh, look at that. 
Look at that. So how did he do that? Okay, well, okay. May, may I offer you a seat in the, in the front row there? Oh, um, just one look, that's all it took? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What is it? Is it jiggling? Yeah. Can I can I observe its oscillation? Oh man, yeah, that's that's disconcerting, isn't it? Yeah, it's probably beating frequency wise. Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna come over lunch. Why don't we leave it for them? And uh, uh, not sure what to suggest. If you blink fast enough, you probably. You probably won't see it, um, but um, but they're going to come at twelve thirty. So that's what they've said. And so I think that's the best thing. It's not affecting our online, the pleasure of our online participants or displeasure. So once this stock goes above one, agents will be created. It'll create those agents. Basically. So what's going to happen is as we run this thing, agents will have flowed down. And, and the idea is, of course, once they reach a certain point in risk, then they get created. And then we follow them thereafter as agents. Larissa has a notable model with this pattern for people at risk um, of homelessness and mental health and, and substance use, use um, which if anyone's interested, she could show. This, of course, is just a, a little stylized representation of it. but. We have used this for a number of models to really good effect, and it's very effective. Why is it so effective? Well, it achieves this incredible economy of lighter weight simulation because the vast majority of the population are often stock and flow models, right? You don't have to, and you don't have to spend your time getting all sorts of detail involved in all sorts of details with their individual characteristics. You you treat them in a, in a very coarse grained way but you have a focal group of interest, and that's who you put your attention into, the ones at risk. So you, you use it as a way of, of um, focusing your energies on the population of greatest interest while still giving a nod to these upstream components, because maybe you want to capture preventive measures. Maybe you want to capture measures that end up affecting this upstream. You certainly want to capture demographic shifts, et cetera. Um, and over time, who is captured at an individual level may change. Maybe you end up bringing it back here. Maybe once people are individuated initially, they flow back when they come out. We've done that in models, like with um, hair seeking after a certain amount of time, if they haven't represented, the representatives after care seeking in case they come back and we wanna keep track. But if they go two years without it, maybe they turn into just a member of the population. We don't have to follow. But we can change this boundary, um, and you know it, it. It does allow us to focus our energies where they're needed, and we have a number of public models. Oh, um, um, indeed. Um, okay. Any question about that idea? That general idea. It's a beautiful idea, and it works really well, and it's it it works in many different circumstances. Okay. Quite compelling. Quite compelling. Uh, very, very practical. Okay, let's talk about system dynamics driven agent evolution. Here we have system dynamics within agents for continuous health dynamics. When I've mentioned this to people who are not modelers across all three, all of these traditions, I've gotten some very weird looks like I'm violating a law of nature. Like, what do you mean, system dynamics within agents? System dynamics is an aggregate tradition. What do you mean it's within a person? You can't have it there. It's, it's, it's not proper. You know, it's against the order of things. No, it's perfectly fine. It captures continuous dynamics on the part of the agent. I mean, you know, get over it. It's, it's, it's not, it's not a, a, a violation of a law of nature. It's just that by convention, it's most commonly applied in an aggregate level. Um, it's not something improper or somehow a violation of, um, science, scientific principles to have it at an individual level. In fact, there's all this study, if, if, you, if you're familiar with any of the um, immunological dynamics literature, 
it's ODE models within a person, within host models that are that have dynamics of you know cytotoxic T lymphocytes and and you know effector cells and uh, and uh, precursor cells and, and and you know infected infected cells and free virions in the bloodstream. If you go look at the physiological literature, there's all these wonderful models of physiologic mechanism by Guyton and others of you know how of liver dynamics or glucose insulin dynamics, et cetera. Bryce is working on uh, with a model of exactly that and where you have conceptually stock and flow models within an individual um, which capture amongst other things, glucose insulin interaction, but also weight dynamics. Um, and so you have weight represented as stocks and flows and it, it varies dynamically with energy intake and basal energy metabolism and physical activity and as it's influenced by breastfeeding, et cetera. So there's nothing improper about this. It, it's purely pragmatic and it's extremely effective. So let's go open a model like that. We're gonna open the model, a model we started working on and I think we published back in uh, 2007. We certainly had published several things in it by about 2009. Um, we have a number of papers applying it to, to more theoretical pathogens as well as um, uh, to chlamydia um, uh, for in-host models and immunoepidemiological models where you have representation inside the body of immune system strength and transmission risks um, driven by that. So let's go open up that model, shall we? Here, watch this. Okay, so we're gonna go to hybrid models. And it's called CTL state variables. That's cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Uh, it's a member of the. It's a component of the uh, cell mediated immunity. And we're going to download it. There we go. Okay. Um, my student Dave Vickers' dissertation centered on said models um, back in 2009, 2010 or so. Um, here we go. So. Um, let us violate cherished shibboleths, and um, we'll we'll show you that these sorts of models can be uh, highly highly practical. Okay, so we're going to go to person here, and here we have a compartment or stock of free variants. That's V. So that's our virus particles in the bloodstream. We have uninfected cells X. If things in the maybe it's in the um, esophagus um, or the up, upper respiratory tract for flu. Um, we have infected cells Y and a stock Z, that's Z for those of you from the US, uh, which represents uh, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, basically these, these immune, um, immune cells which kill off infected. This is an extremely simple representation just for a demo. We, have, uh, we do have a paper that shows this um, and shows its implications for spread across the population. But we have quite a lot more sophisticated models of chlamydia, which are specialized to that. This is from a book, though, by uh, Wadars, I think, um, and Nowak um, on immunological modeling. And so we adapted the model. Um, so there's immune system builds up over time. As, as there are more and more um, infected cells, it builds up immune system activity. It turns over, the immune system cells die off over time, but while they're active, they kill off these uh, infected cells to try to stop the spread of infection. These infected cells in turn, while they're present, they undergo lysis, um, perhaps apoptosis, and they lead to free virions in the population um, that build up there. And they can be cleared, um, and, but you can also get it from a neighbor in the neck. So you can get infected say, be a, a coughing neighbor through aerosols with flu. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so they can't see me uh, on the, on the um, I tried to position the camera. Oh, oh, it got, okay, it got moved, I guess, from when I did that. Thank you for letting me know. Because I tried to position it earlier so that, this was was easily visible, but it looks like it's gotten reset. I'll have to deal with that later. Okay, so yeah, thanks. Um, uh, so we have this, this system here that simulates spread within a person. You'll notice there's also a discrete characterization of state where someone can be living or dead, and 
they die if they have a level of virus infection above a certain threshold. So if their V level, their level of free variants um, goes above a certain threshold, they, they die, okay? Um, now, we can use this to examine the effects of spread of infection in a heterogeneous population. In particular, we can have people, for example, with different levels of immune strength as it affects C here. Um, there's a set of parameters here by which we might describe a given person's immune characteristics. So we're going to run it first with the high, oh, I should say within this model, if you go to main and you go down to space and networks, people are in a distance-based network with a, with a certain connection, okay? Um, and uh, there are moreover uh, a certain number of, of people uh, in the population um, uh, in this case. Okay, so we're just going to say run here. Um, it's 100 people in the population, and we have a high viral load threshold here. So in other words, uh, it would take a really strong infection to kill someone off. So what you see is, oh, we have illustrated here, the redness is how much free variance they have, how much V, and the width of this is the strength of their immune system response. So you'll notice if we turn this down a little bit, um, uh, a given, uh, so these nodes are people, and, uh, and you'll notice that they turn red and then they uh, end up expanding as the immune system captures it and uh, starts to attack the uh, infected cells. It brings it under control, the, vir the virus levels drop, a lot, and then the person's immune system strength shrinks down some um, as they as they recover. Um, these ones are just in the earlier stage of infection, so they're still expanding out, particularly this one here, and it goes down. And so each of these is infecting others. They are spreading the infection to others. I'm not showing the details of that, but it turns out it's through this flow here. Um, it's this flow here. Um, uh, basically, it draws uh, viral load from, from neighbors. So this is not something where they're sending messages right now. They're just you know, like picking up aerosols from neighbors. We could do it with sending messages if it were sexual. Uh, so here we have dynamics within an individual captured by stocking. Now, this might not be your area. You might say, well, okay, that's interesting for immune dynamics. How is that useful in other cases? Well, I could tell you it could be very useful. This could be, maybe your interest is a mental health and addiction. Maybe this is a representation of um, tolerance levels for, um, for certain opioids. Maybe it's for heroin. And if someone is unable to get heroin for a while because of supply disruption during the pandemic, um, uh, perhaps uh, their tolerance level drops when they get heroin again and they take a dose to which they've been used, they end up overdosing. Um, and and you, you might imagine uh, equally much a model like that capturing the fact that when someone's prescribed OxyContin for chronic pain, they build up tolerance. And uh, that tolerance level rises in the amount they have to be prescribed for the same you know, analgesic effect rises as well. Um, uh, so we can capture dynamics associated with, with um, tolerance levels for, for, for narcotics. We can alternatively capture dynamics associated with weight and body composition. Large set of excellent models there, including some from Kevin Hall, formerly of University of Alberta, now an uh, intramural researcher at NIH. Um, uh, capturing sort of dynamics based on exquisite experiments they conduct um, there. Uh, there's any number of different models. You could have a theory of what's going on within an individual that is, uh, that is quite, uh, quite rich. Um, and we can capture it with exactly these sort, of, um, uh, these sort of stock and flow models within a person. Stock and flow models, are great for capturing theory about continuous quantities 
such as those we've just been just been discussing. Um, okay, so I think you get the idea there. I'm going to uh, just trot out uh, one or two other examples, and then we'll go on to um, to another type. So some of you might be interested under hybrid models looking at environmental contamination hybrid. Here, the environmental contamination is leading to a stock of pathogen in certain locations, workplaces, homes. And that pathogen can, um, can end up infecting some of those present. So I downloaded this here. And I'm glad to see Maurice has had some, um, some luck with that for fish farm. That's awesome. Um, so I'm going to put in for any logic, we'll go. Uh, open up this environmental contamination. Okay, so here we don't have people with, with these stocks of pathogen. No, no, no. But what we have is workplaces, which have pathogen reservoirs, and homes, which have shedded reservoirs. Think aerosols in the air, for example. Maybe in other cases, maybe it's Norwalk virus, uh, norovirus, and you're thinking about, you know, um, uh, fecal oral transmission, and there's some there's some pathogen reservoir there, or maybe it's, um, maybe it's associated with um, some other surface transmitted pathogen like MRSA, MRSA. Um, so here we have um, homes and workplaces. Uh, here we have people, a, a person can be susceptible, they can be infective, in which case they'll be shedding, or they can be recovered. While infective, they're not transmitting person to person, they're shedding virus or shedding pathogen. Okay, maybe it's Vibrio cholerae. Um, and they can either be at home or at work. Um, and uh, here, we're going to have a, uh, a simple model. We'll have uh, uh, a small population here. We'll, we'll start it with a small population. Oh, yeah. And so we will, oh, I should say at workplace, for example, um, there's a per capita shedding rate here. And, um, and basically, we multiply this per capita shedding rate by the number of people that are infected here in the workplace. So we ask, who, which agents are around? And then how many infectives are there amongst them? And that leads to build up of this pathogen reservoir, and then it decays over time. So, so let's run it with a small population. And I'm, I'm mindful of the time. Uh, I want to finish this up uh, soon. Um, so uh, here we go, and we have people and homes, and then we have their workplaces. And uh, you notice this home is a bit of red. It's, it's getting pathogen built up there. Uh-oh, they spread it now to their workplace. Because the workplace, it ended up spreading to one of the other people in the population. So here, basically, we have a spread of infection via the workplace from home to home. And you can have a spread of infection from home to home via the workplace or a spread of infection from workplace to workplace via a home. Um, and, you know, I could say I could run it with a much larger population, right? A medium, small population. So here, stock and flow models, um, stock and flow modeling is being used within agents. What are the agents? Homes and, and workplaces. See that? Yeah. Um, simple idea, um, but a very powerful one that for many situations can be useful, um, particularly if you're dealing with things like uh, environmental epi, et cetera. Um, okay, I am uh, going to, uh, I think I'll, I'll move on in the interest of time. Um, you might wanna run it with a small medium population and what that means. Um, okay, um, now uh, next I want to examine another Catherine, um, uh, where you have agents driving system dynamics. So here, um, so we saw stock and flows within agents. There's a lot more of them. I provided you a bunch of these models, um, including some with kind of geographic motivation where you have patches in space where we have infected mosquitoes, for example, and we track mosquito populations with stocks and flows but they're in agents which represent patches and they talk to other agents nearby. 
sort of wire them together nicely. Um, let's talk about agents drive system energy. So the idea here, um, and I don't know if we'll have time to, to show this one, but um, and I'm not, I'd have to check what, what models I had in mind for this, but agent, here we have agent populations that drive a higher level um, population. So you might have agents that represent um, adverse actors like, um, uh, like tobacco companies that are affecting you know, the promotion of tobacco to uh, youth. And, and you have interaction between these actors, maybe some are public health actors as well. And the public health actors are trying to counter the effects of tobacco companies. And all of those are then influencing um, the, the population's health um, uh, up here um, uh, in, in, in terms of development of an at-risk population, et cetera. Um, uh, you might alternatively have um, uh, you know, aspects of uh, development of vaccines or something, and those get uh, delivered up here, et cetera. These might be uh, NGOs um, or, or civil society organizations of some sort that are involved in a way that impacts uh, public health. So simple idea, but basically stocks and flows showing the evolution of the population, for example, are influenced by agents. Okay? And the agents here are often at a, at a, at a higher level. Um, the final one I'll mention is, is aggregate system dynamics drives um, agent population. Um, and here SD system dynamics capture stock and flow models captures environmental and, and policy dynamics. So um, you know we might um, we might have, for example, a uh, this is actually from West Nile model. We have mosquitoes and it will be a fool's errand to try to capture all the mosquitoes in Saskatchewan in the summer with an, with an agent based model. Wouldn't you agree, Theresa? Yeah, and um, so instead we have a stock and flow model of environmental dynamics, like like mosquitoes at different points in the life cycle and um, in infection, and those end up affecting an agent uh, of people. And those people have different risk factors. They live in different locations. We can it's an agent-based characterization, so we could say. You know, where are they situated within Saskatchewan? You know, geographically, um, what are their, you know, pre-existing conditions and risk factors? What's their immune system, you know, condition from that? Uh, basically, um, what's their age? Sex capture rich heterogeneity, and if they're exposed to mosquito, um, you know, that that has West Nile virus, um, some of those individuals may be at high risk of presenting, needing to present for care, developing acute flaccid paralysis. Or, or encephalitis, uh, meningitis, and, and even death. Um, so um, agent populations here are used to capture the people, and we capture environmental dynamics with this, um, uh, with this stock flow. And those pathogen reservoirs have a little bit of that flavor as well. Um, uh, right, so um, I think I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll come to a, a close shortly. Maybe I'll show you because there was interest expressed here. Um, we're, we're getting on time wise, but I'm going to, I think, show you one more model live. If you go to, and I'm trying to find the right screen. Here we go. Um, if you go to health economics, it's called basic health economics, um, ABM. Um, so it's under hybrid. There it is, it's the second one. Okay. Um, and you were to download this. Boom. Um, let's, let's open this up and I wanna, I'm gonna use it to sort of showcase uh, a model where you have agents driving stock and flow at the highest level. I didn't show that just a minute ago it was our fourth sort of um, compelling pattern. Um, uh, this one, uh, this uh, this one here. Um, I, I do. We do have time to show that. So, and given interest in health economics, I thought I'd mention. So, here we go. If we go in, we have this is kind of 
again, these are thought piece models. Um, a lot of these I built up oh, live in these boot camps. So in response to interest, um, these things get built on themselves. Um, here we have normal glycemic, pre-diabetic, type two diabetic, people with end-stage renal disease and transplant, uh, transplant recipients. Um, and, um, and, and all of them are subject to a mortality hazard. Um, but all of them also share um, the characteristic of having, based on their state, a certain quality of life and a certain amount of cost per year. Um, so this is kind of an activity-based costing model. There's a cost per year being in certain states. So if someone has end-stage renal disease, that you know the, the cost to deliver them dialysis are very subsidized. If they have transplant, there's a cost associated with uh, the drugs to maintain transplant borne by the, the healthcare system um, in Canada. Um, type 2 diabetes also has costs associated with it. And you can see I use variables. I should be familiar with idioms for you. I use variables when you enter a state to record the quality of life that obtained for this person since they're in the state. Remember we did that early with color? Remember, remember you? Remember the you and the color? Yeah. Um, and they have a certain cost, right? And, and if they're in this state, they have cost per year $50,000. Is that right? Canadian dollars. And, and a quality of life of you know, cost. Um, okay, so that's one component of cost, but there's another component too. When they undergo a transplant operation, um, it also increases their cost reflective of that event, of that occurrence of the transplant. The transplant operation, the post-op and, and workup and you know all the sort of processes associated with it, with getting the living or deceased donor kidney, et cetera, those have costs. And, and it's estimated about 75 Canadian, Canadian dollars. Um, so so we have we have costs that accrue um, in an activity-based costing type of way, both being in a certain state per year they're in that state, say, as well as costs that come about because of an event. And if I had more detail here, and we have a very detailed agent hybrid um, agent-based model for, for um, end-stage renal disease, you know, we would have graft failure where a transplant, unfortunately, is rejected and so on. But anyway, the point is costs accrue here uh, and quality of life is maintained here. So all of this is at an individual level where it's easy to characterize these costs, right? We know the state someone could be in. If we had comorbid conditions, we could consider those as well in the quality of life. You know, people with diabetes and heart disease together, or diabetes and um, COPD. Um, we could consider quality of life measures and cost measures that might be coupled. Okay, um, but having done that, if we go up to Maine, or we go down Maine, um, uh, what we'll see is um, uh, that uh, that we're actually recording these things at a global level too. So here we have qualities lived in the population over time that we accumulate across the population. For those not familiar with this lingo of, of health economics, this quality adjusted life here. And basically we're keeping track, not only with the number of life years lived by the population, not only you know, that it's 100 people living for 50 years and as a result, it would be you know, 5,000 life years lived, 50 times, times 100. Um, but we're, we're also considering the quality of that life. As the WHO said, we want to add, we, in, our, in our approaches to public health, we want to value not only adding years to life, but life to years. And, and this means you know, keeping people, if possible, in higher quality of life space. Right? Um, and so often when we're looking at this through a, oh, through a quality of life lens or, or, or health economics lens, we want to consider not just life. Um, okay, so we, we might want to consider not just the life years accumulated. That's what this is, the stock and flow model. This is an idiom. This is an accumulator. It's accumulating 
quality of life or life years over time. If we had 100 people here um, uh, and, and uh, in the first year, um, it would be 100 life years lived. After the second year, be 100 more, 200 that have been accrued. After the third year, be 100 more, 300 that have been accrued. After their 50 years, it would be 5,000 life years that have totaled up. So that, that's what this idiom is. It's just totaling it up over time. Right? In technical terms, it's integrating it up. OK, so we're integrating up the population size. Hmm? That's all the same notion I gave it. Here, we're integrating up the population quality of life over the population. And where is this? Guess what this is? You recognize this idiom? You exercise this idiom within this very room as recently as yesterday. What is this thing I'm calling here? Begins with an S. It lives in population. We call it, and it gives us back a number. It's a statistic. Cumulative quality of life, if we go look at the population, it's defined as a statistic. There it is, cumulative quality of life. Yeah, it just totals up across the entire population. It sums up the quality of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Each person contributes. So if a person has, um, if you have 100 people here, and each of them is a quality of life, God forbid, of 0.5, then that there, in terms of life years accumulated, there'll be 100 for the, after the first year. But in terms of quality adjusted life years, it'll be 50 because they're only living at 50% quality quality of life, as he listed it through you know, various uh, quality of life instruments um, uh, that he listed health utility, health utility scale. Um, OK. so. So here we have quality adjusted life years being accumulated from the population. That is being accumulated from the population statistic. And this is summing it up over this population of people that we just saw there. Right? Each person has quality of life and cost right now. And we're summing up their quality of life across the population. Mm. Mm. Um, and, uh, and then we have costs, right? We're, we're summing up across the population costs. And we and those come from two sources. One is from the people themselves. Mm. So this is a statistic too. We're summing up their costs, their per year costs, summing them up, integrating them up. There we go. Um, and let's go take a look at them. This is new cost per year. So all we're doing is we're integrating up the cost per year of each person in the population. Where was that set? It was set right here. When they go into the ABD state, they have a certain amount of cost per year. You see that? All we're doing is we're totaling up across that population how much cost they're occurring per year, we're totaling it up. So maybe each of these 100 people with diabetes uh, is imposing 2,000 costs per year. And so we have. $200,000 of cost accumulated to the healthcare system within that person. Does that make sense? Okay, and, and then we have intervention costs because we can have interventions and we can sort of invest in aggressive pre-diabetes prevention programs. And guess what that's going to affect? Well, it's, and it's gonna affect some, you could see from it being turned bold here, it's going to, impact uh, the risk of becoming pre-diabetic. Um, uh, so it's going to affect here this pre-diabetic um, risk of becoming pre-diabetic. And um, uh, mumble, uh, it should. Um, I'm, I'm looking for where that impacts things. This is, um, ah, here we are. OK, it actually impacts the likelihood of them recovering from, from pre-diabetes okay. um, and going back to a normal glycemic state. Um, so each of these interventions costs something too. They have a per capita cost and then some sort of, um, 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 I, I guess this is, uh, um, okay, they, they have a cost for non-diabetics and, and diabetics perhaps. I, I'd have to look at it more closely. Um, but uh, maybe a screening cost and then a cost to undertake the, the intervention. 
Um, and so it is for, for other types. Um, for example, um, we have aggressive intervention. Maybe it, it's influencing things at, at several, several different places. In any case, uh, we could run this and we will have an agent-based model giving rise to these health economics quantities at an overall level. Um, quality adjusted life years, life years lived, accumulated costs, and we can have uh, accumulated discounted costs as well. And of course, for those familiar with, with health economics, you might have discounted quality adjusted life years too. Okay, so here, high level stock and flow, totaling up things across the entire population. Simple idea, tends to be quite easy to implement in, in this sort of way using quantities of the sort that, that you've built up, like statistics and variables and state code. Okay. Um, okay, so to wrap up here, lunch beckons and so does so do the, the uh, um, so do the AB folks. Um, um, you know, we we have these powerful ways to bring these methods together. Maybe I'll rather than diving into one type, I'll just you know mention again a few more here. We have things we can more easily represent with one framework than another. We can represent people's exposure to to contamination and workplaces and homes and schools really easily in an agent-based framework, but we can capture the dynamics of pathogen in those locations within a soft um, uh, We have different questions we're asking. That first model we looked at with people seeking care in clinics and you know, with treatment mediated recovery, et cetera, we could ask, questions about the public health situation and see how does it ripple across public health outcomes, but also service utilization in the clinic. And conversely, we could ask about staffing or availability of clinics questions, resourcing questions on the healthcare system and see the public health consequences of that. We can ask different sorts of questions with different parts of the model. We can evolve what is captured. Think about those budding models. What is captured as system dynamics? What's captured as, as an agent-based component? By changing that as, as, we, as our understanding of what we need to represent and how we want to represent it change. We might represent more at a fine-grained level, for example. Um, uh, we can present different aspects to stakeholders. Um, uh, we can speak to clinicians in terms they understand without representing the whole model as agent. We can have greater computational efficiency because 80% of the population is not represented as agent. It's represented as counts until it becomes really important that they be represented and followed at an individual level model. And finally, we can have this multi-scale model. We can have stock and flow within a person and a person and families and in Household, you know, households, and then um, and then neighborhoods and um, cities, and and capture that nested context, and use the right mechanism at, at the right level um, for what's what's best. And to tie this back to those comments on computational efficiency, I said one of the the key insights from this notion of computational excuse me, computational universality is that you know it's not a matter of can this do X. It's a matter of what's the best tool for the job. And this is about not having a toolbox with just one tool. It's having a toolbox with several tools and picking the right tool for your job. So you want you wanna, you know, cut through a set of wood, you don't have to use the hammer or the the, the screwdriver. When you want to put on a new roof, you have that. Um uh you you pick the right tool for the job and you learn over time and you adapt. Some of that is keeping models side by side and, and using a portfolio to learn. Some of it is mixing them. And this is arguably any logic's foremost strength. It's the ability to weave together models with multiple types of any logic. 
that in some ways define it as any body. Okay, so anyway, those are all the comments uh, I, I have here on the issue of hybrid modeling and the issue of modeling trade-offs. Um, I'm of course glad to, to expound further if there were interest, but why don't we go to lunch right now? And this afternoon, we have some really exciting stuff. We're gonna bring in spatial models and situating people in space in geospatial with geographic situation and, and using tapping geographic information. Okay. And Larissa, do you think um, you would be available for um, to to escort their participants? Okay. Um, that would be awesome. Thank you very much. And over lunch, I will rest. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for bearing with the AV situation. That was a difficult thing to navigate, but I think we may be mostly out of the woods now. Um, thanks very much. I think I will disconnect this so we can get started on processing the uh, video uh, over lunch. It takes a while, and it means I don't have to stay here quite as late in the evening. Um, and uh, we'll reconnect in, um, I think, one hour, so one thirty or 135, give you folks a little bit of time to get back. Okay, thank you folks, take care there, and uh, we'll see you in about an hour. Yes. Yeah. Right, so, so sure. Um,